Elizabeth, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about, so you, you developed nanoparticles that can cross the blood-brain barrier. That's right. a, don't be modest, that's a <laughs> big accomplishment. I mean, um, and I think that's a great example of how, of a complex system of the body trying to prevent these things from right. getting in. Absolutely. I mean, how did you approach that problem and uh, uh, why after, you know, been working on within nanoparticles for, for decades and no one else has done this, so how did you figure it out? Ah, <laughs> that's a great question. So, um, so I, first, I think most people, it's probably helpful uh, just to frame this in the context of the brain. The blood-brain barrier, for those of you that haven't heard about it, um, is basically this highly regulated protective barrier between your blood vessels and the brain tissue. And it's considered to be one of the most regulated barriers in the body. Um, it's made up of cells that surround your blood vessels, and those cells and the proteins between these cells are highly regulated by other cells within the brain, by things like blood flow, your breathing rate, your metabolism. And you want that to be the case. You want this to be highly regulated. You don't want just anything getting into the brain. So that's good for normal day-to-day -day functioning, but very bad if you need to get a drug in to actually have an effect. Uh, the benefit, I think, and something that hadn't really been thoroughly studied is the fact that the blood-brain barrier in many diseases is often impaired. Um, but the extent of impairment varies from person to person, disease to disease, the way the disease started, how it progresses. And that hadn't been well studied. And it hadn't been well studied because there wasn't really enough of an understanding of how things move within the body um, and how they move within the brain. And so it seems like a fairly simple, um, simple concept. But when you put something into your body, you want it to be able to move as readily as possible until you don't need it to move anymore, right? You want it to move until it gets to the site of interest. Well, in the brain, there have been clinical trials for 50, 60 years with different technologies trying to get things to get to the brain and then move, and none of them had. And the main reason is because your brain is very effective at making sure this blood-brain barrier is working well enough to not allow things through. But even once you get it across, there's all this junk. And I know I probably offend most neuroscientists when I call that junk. But there's a lot of junk in the brain. There's cells, there's proteins, there's blood vessels. You've got to move through all this junk if you want to get to your side of interest. And so one of the things we started looking at, and this was purely from an engineering approach, was what governs movement, what doesn't govern movement, what properties of a particle system, which for us were scalable to proteins, small molecule drugs, what properties of that system, like size and surface charge and composition and molecular weight, were going to govern the ability of something to not only cross that blood-brain barrier, but then be able to move and distribute within the brain. And so we were able to do that actually with a couple particle platforms because we found some very fundamental principles. We like to take, I always make fun of chemical engineers, but that's because I am one, so I feel like I can. We like to take like sort of the simplest way possible. Um, so one of the things that I've been really interested in is finding what's common. What can we take advantage of that is common amongst many diseases? And movement in the brain in every sort of, every sort of brain disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, tumors, whatever you're talking about, is necessary to be able to reach the multiple regions you need a drug to get to to actually have an effect. And so we started looking just broadly what governs movement in the brain. And if we can understand what governs movement from the brain, can we then, being the typical engineers, control it? And if we can control it, then can we have a profound effect? And we've been able to do that in a couple tumors, cerebral palsy, um, and a neonatal stroke model is sort of the areas that we've been able to show that if we can improve movement alone, solely the ability to move within the brain better, that we can actually improve therapeutic outcomes. So we can have the, most of these are in animal models, we can have the animals live longer, we can have them behave more normally. Um, we don't have any of these off-site side effects because the drugs are only getting where they need to go, but they're able to readily move and get to those regions of interest.